And just as I just mentioned this morning, I'm going to be talking about grace. If you were to go out into the community and ask, say, a oh, hundred people to tell you what they thought grace was or what grace meant, you might be surprised at the number of responses or different answers that you might get. And there seems to be a lot of confusion about grace when it comes to religious matters. And it was one of Paul's favorite words to use. And so it is also a common phrase that's used within Christian circles. But what does it mean? Well, this morning I'm not going to talk about the, the definition of grace, but rather about grasping the concept of grace and the reality of it in our own lives. On the next several occasions when I have the opportunity to speak up here, I'm going to speak further about this theme on grace, not only by defining the terms, but even more by looking at the examples of those people that had the experience of receiving God's grace both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In many of their stories, grace isn't even mentioned in those events, but it certainly permeates those stories and those events. And so let's start with a definition of what is grace? Well, if you look up on an online dictionary, you would find that the word grace is used no less than 20 different times in the uh, English language. Everything from a prayer said before a meal to the <coughs> grace period that we find in an, in, in an insurance policy. All the way from the grace of your presence or the presence of someone before you, it's called, I'm gracing you with my presence, or to a person's name, all the way to the title of nobility, where someone will say, your grace. So you can see that there are many different uh, usages of the word grace, but in the biblical sense, the word, the Greek word we find there for grace is charis, and it simply means a gift, something received without having earned it. When applied to God's word, that's exactly what grace is. God extending his divine mercy and favor and forgiveness when we actually deserve his condemnation. Someone once said that grace is getting what we need rather than what we deserve. And that's what Paul was talking about when he wrote all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that, Paul also says, therefore, we are justified by his grace as a gift. Exactly the opposite of what we deserve, but exactly what we need. In verse 8 of the scripture reading that we had this morning, Paul emphasizes the undeserved nature of grace by saying, this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. And this is all made possible by Jesus' death on the cross. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John, um, or in chapter 1 of John, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Not because of our works, not even the works of God's own law, but because of Jesus, because he bore the penalty of our sins for us. If salvation were by works, we would earn it, and then Jesus' de death would have been for nothing, or it would have been meaningless, actually. And in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, Paul also wrote, if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died to no purpose. So grace is a wonderful concept, and it is actually our only hope. But we sometimes have such a hard time with grasping and handling the concept of grace. And why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, because of our natural tendency to expect to get what we deserve. 
Little kids often use a phrase or pick up the phrase quite quickly as they begin to learn about life. And sometimes we even carry that phrase into adulthood. You hear it. It's not fair. That's not fair, right? And so getting what we deserve is okay if we're talking about the pat on the back for doing a good job or for the pay that we receive at the end of the week. But when it comes to God's judgment, the last thing we want is what we deserve. And so it's not about fair, it's about what we desperately need. If you were to see, for example, someone that was on the street that had no money and was starving and was just basically dying for food, and if you were to give them some food, did they earn it? They didn't do anything to earn it, right? They didn't do any work for you. They didn't pay you for it. But it's something they desperately need. And so it's more than just what we uh, deserve, but what we need. And that's how God's grace works for us. And secondly, because we don't comprehend the depth of our own sinfulness. If you think of sin as simply a few isolated mistakes committed by an otherwise decent person, we may not sense the need for grace because our thinking is, well, I messed up and I'll just clean it up myself. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul says, without grace we are dead in our trespasses. And the dead can't do anything to help themselves. And too far, uh, they're too far gone in order to help themselves, correct? Have you ever seen a dead person fall dead and then say, well, I think I'll get up and dig my grave? Oh, we can't, we're too far gone, okay? And sin isn't a minor ailment either that will go away on its own or uh, through our own efforts. Rather, it's a deadly infection that permeates our being and therefore we need God's grace, which is the cure. Sin is a violation of God's holiness and an offense against his nature. That's why it results in his wrath in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 talks about the wrath of God uh, against those who are unholy. And so God's grace can save us from his wrath. And it's the only thing that will save us from his wrath. And thirdly, because sometimes we're super sensitive about our guilt. You know, uh, we know just how sinful we really are. And it's sometimes hard for us to believe that someone who knows all about us could possibly extend grace to us or forgiveness. And we know we don't deserve it, but that's why it's called grace. God knows full well just how sinful we really are, but loves us anyway and offers what we need most, but can't get for ourselves. And fourthly, because we have an unbalanced understanding of God's nature. It's true that God is entirely holy, and demands righteousness from us and cannot tolerate sin. But that's not the whole story about God. It's also true that he loves us and isn't a harsh judge wanting to condemn us or a referee who is looking to uh, or for the opportunity in order to throw a flag and to penalize us and maybe kick us out of the game. We don't want to make the same mistake that Martin Luther made when he wrote, I lost touch with Christ, the Savior and Comforter, and made him the jailer and hangman of my poor soul. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, Paul wrote, God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It is true that he judges those who reject his grace, but he wants more than anything to save us. Why would he send his son otherwise? 
God wants a relationship with us. And as you read through the Old Testament, you see how he continuously tries to develop that relationship with man and to be with man. And today he is with us as, a, as he dwells within us when we are baptized and saved and become a Christian. And fifthly, because we transfer our experience with unforgiving human relationships unto God. Maybe you were brought up around those people who did not practice forgiveness. You may have heard comments such as, I don't get mad, I just get even. And it's uh, sometimes hard for us to believe anyone ever truly forgives the guilty. Even God, we assume, doesn't forgive the guilty. But we shouldn't practice or project the faces of those onto God. Maybe you're an unforgiving person, one who cherishes grudges, and you assume God is like you. In an article in the Gospel Advocate some time ago, there was a, an article about forgiveness and a man wrote in response to it, and he wrote, God won't forgive people if they don't repent so neither can we. And I suspect that it was actually the other way around in this man's thinking, and that I don't want to forgive people, therefore God doesn't forgive. But the good news is God isn't like us in the fact that he wants to forgive us. And sixthly, because we've gotten the idea that guilt is the reason we serve God, and if we lose our guilt motivation, we won't be faithful. You might have thought this or may have heard other people feel this uh, by saying something like, well, I'll feel guilty if I don't do this, or therefore I am guilty because I don't do this. But uh, a news flash on that is that uh, guilt motivation will only take you so far in your obedience to God. You'll probably do only as much as you think is necessary in order to avoid those guilty feelings. A far more powerful motivation is God's grace. The gratitude and knowing that God has already pardoned us of our sins and our gratitude in order that is there for us to want to obey Him. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 9 through 10, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. And seventhly, because we've been taught there's no grace or mercy unless you do everything just right. The problem with that is, is that that's not grace at all. That's actually perfectionism. And a lot of people think it's the gospel, but it isn't. In fact, that's actually really bad news. The gospel, which is the good news, is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God accepts us as we are and gets rid of our sins by the power of Jesus' blood. He doesn't wait for us to become perfect. Now, don't get me wrong, pleasing God ought to be the goal of every disciple and every believer. But we're fallen, we're fallen human beings and it isn't possible for us to get everything perfect. It just doesn't happen. And if we could, we would be saving ourselves and we wouldn't need Jesus at all. But we can't and so therefore we do need Jesus. It isn't my righteousness plus God's grace that equals salvation. For example, if you were to see a turtle up on top of a post, you would believe that someone had helped that turtle to get up there. Because there are several things we know about turtles, right? First of all, we know that they can't climb. Second of all, we know they can't jump. And third of all, we know they can't fly. 
So therefore, it had to have had help to get there. And just as the turtle needed the help to get on top of that post, we need help to get into heaven. Because there is no way that we're ever going to climb into heaven, nor are we going to jump into heaven, nor will we fly into heaven. But it was only through the grace of God and His help that we will be able to get there. And that's how it is with grace. We have no righteousness of our own to plead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 through 31, it says, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. There is a parable in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Most of you know it, know it maybe quite well. It's the parable about, and the title of it is the parable of the unmerciful servant. You know the parable, the master comes to claim his debt of his servants. And one of the servants that has come before him owes a great sum of money. This sum of money is so great that this man couldn't possibly pay it off in a hundred lifetimes. Scholars tell us the value of that would be somewhere on the order of six billion dollars. I can't even imagine trying to pay a debt off of a million dollars, much less six billion. And yet, this servant, after the master had said, sell him, his wife, and his children, came pleading to the master and asked that he pardon him to the point to give him the opportunity to pay back. Well, the master knew full well that there was no way that he would ever be able to do that. And so having pity on this servant, the master pardons him and forgives his debt. And of course, you know the rest of the story. He goes out, he finds a servant that owes him money. And the scholars also tell us that the value of that debt was only about $12,000, a mere pittance to the amount that he owed his master. And so the stories also often emphasized on the unmerciful servant. But the story is really about God's mercy. Because you see, that hopeless debtor is us. We have a debt to God that is so great there is no way we could ever pay it off. And, but it's because of God's forgiveness of our debt, of our sins, and that we receive His grace. And He also expects us to be merciful to others as well. And that's what grace is. Owing God everything, being unable to pay back anything. Yet, being forgiven of all because of Jesus' blood and because there is simply no other way. A powerful motivation to cast ourselves uh, completely on His grace. No payback, no bargains, just accepting by faith and our obedience is what He offers in His grace to us. And it is my hope that this morning, as you contemplate this lesson on grace, that you will leave here thinking and honoring God and praising Him with joy in your heart of just how great a God we serve that has pardoned us of a debt that we could never pay. And so, are you ready to say with Paul, by grace, by the grace of God, I am who I am or who or what I am? If you're not a Christian, you cannot receive God's grace. There is only one way in which you can receive the grace of God, and that is through believing in Jesus Christ, believing that He is the Son of God and confessing that before men, and then repenting, that is to turn away from your sins and walk in a direction in the obedience of the will of God and then to be baptized 
for the remission of your sins. It is through baptism that you receive the grace of God, the washing away of your sins and your obedience. But yet, it is still must remember that this gift is not anything that we've earned because of something we've done, but rather because of what God has done for us, but what Jesus actually has done for us in paying that price. And so if you are a, a Christian and here today and you have fallen into sin and you need to repent of that transgression or those transgressions, you can come today. Whatever your needs are, come while together we stand and sing the invitation song.